Hello and welcome to this basics episode on track and their permanent way. A railway locomotive is, to be honest, pretty much useless without the proper track to run it on. So this week we're going to take a look at the track. And in so doing we're going to delve right back into the history of the first railways. But first we need to ask a question, what is a railway? The best answer so far is a definition by Dr. Michael Lewis, a world-renowned expert on early railways and writer of the de facto book on wooden railways. He has this to say, in its most basic sense, a railway is a prepared track which so guides the vehicles running upon it that they cannot leave the track. The vehicle need not be wheeled, for a sledge will serve. The method by which the vehicle is prevented from leaving the track varies, the flanged wheel being one of several. For centuries the vehicle was moved by hand, by horsepower or gravity. For centuries too, the material used for the track was wood. The earliest railways were probably what are known as dialkos from ancient Greece and Rome, a form of rotway, therefore a form of guiding a vehicle on a fixed track. But the jury is out how old they are is they're very hard to date, and whether these are deliberate or just the result of wear over a long period of time. Incidentally, there's a load of absolute rubbish about George Stevenson inventing the railway and rushing off to Hadrian's Wall to measure the roots of Roman chariots, and thereby inventing the standard gate. We then move forward to the medieval period, and to Germany, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. Here we are dealing with the earliest mine railways, a form of railway called a Litnagel Hunt, or a guide pin railway. A Hunt is a small mining truck, usually very narrow, with large wheels at the back and small wheels at the front, little bigger than a wheelbarrow. They were pushed along a plank road, the planks of which were laid longitudinally supported by transverse sleepers. As these huns were used underground, often in the pitch dark, it's easy to see how the guide pin, or litnagel, came into being. The pin slotted into a gap a couple of inches wide in the centre of the plankway so as to guide the hund along the track, rather like a racing slot car. These guide pin railways remained in use for a very long time, from the 1550s into the 1830s in some cases. The next development from the litnagel with a central channel to guide a pin was a channel or flanged railway. These were wooden rails with either an L-shaped or a U-shaped cross section in which the wooden wheels of mining carts travelled. The earliest evidence for these is from about 1430 again in Germany, becoming more popular in the 1550s and again remaining in use for centuries well into the middle of the 19th century. A third type of early wooden railway was the guide wheel railway or Riesen. Unlike the Litnagel hunts, these tended to be used above ground and appeared in the 1560s. They used half round sawn timbers laid longitudinally and supported on transverse sleepers to make the track. The mining trucks themselves had narrow bodies and large wheels with flanges, often looking more like rollers or cotton reels. The first railways in Britain were imported from Germany. During the Elizabethan period, Daniel Hochstetter from Germany was invited by the Company of Mines Royal to use his expertise in working silver mines to the Lake District in Cumbria in 1568, and there is ample documentary and also archaeological evidence showing that Litnagel hunts were in use in those silver mines in the Lake District. The next development was essentially a refinement of the Riesen, or Guide Wheel Railway. We find probably the first English railway, the Wallerton Wagonway in Nottinghamshire, being opened in 1604 as a means of expediting the carriage of coal from pits to the nearest river for onward transit. These railways had longitudinal, often hardwood rails secured on transverse wooden sleepers, packed around with ballast. And this naturally brings us on to terminology. In the northeast of England, around Newcastle, in County Durham, and in Northumbria, what we would term a railway was invariably known as a wagon road. A wagon being invariably a vehicle for use on a railway, whilst a wain, and we think of John Constable's famous painting, the hay wain, was a large vehicle used on roads. The term railroad is a term from the English county of Shropshire, 
the word rail in the 15th, 16th and 17th century referring to fencing. And indeed a wooden railway looks an awful lot like a fence or even a ladder laid on the ground. Whilst in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire the term for a railway is a gangway, in Yorkshire the terminology was mixed, showing influence from the northeast with the term Newcastle Road, and also from Shropshire with the terms railroad and railway also being in use, and in South Wales tram or dramway. Each of these different regional areas also had their favoured gauges. In the northeast, a gauge from four to five feet was common, whilst in Shropshire, a narrower gauge from three to four feet was preferred. In Yorkshire, gauges like terminology were mixed, the Middleton Railway in Leeds being laid to a gauge of four feet, showing influence from the northeast, whilst many lines in the West Riding were laid to a gauge of three feet four inches, showing a Shropshire influence. The first railway in Scotland, the Tranent to Cockenzie Wagonway of 1722, was laid to a gauge of 3 feet 3, showing Shropshire influence in that regard, but a Geordie influence in terminology. The big spur for building railways in England came with the restoration of 1660, particularly in the North East, again for carrying coal. At first, these wooden railways had a single layer of timber rails, but as these rapidly wore out, these were replaced by a double way, with two sets of wooden rails laid on top of the other. Later still, wrought iron straps were nailed on top to improve longevity. The earliest standard gauge railway so far discovered in Britain is the Willington Wagonway from 1785, a 33 metre stretch of it being excavated in 2013. It was amazingly well preserved and included the main way, a set of points and a by way leading to a wash pond so that the wooden wheels of the wagons could be soaked to prevent them drying and splitting. Part of another wooden railway, the Lampton Main Colliery Railway of about 1812 was excavated in the 1990s and this included several sets of wooden points. It was built to a gauge of 4 feet 3 inches. The Killingworth Colliery Railway which is important because it's where George Stevenson worked, used part of the Willington Wagonway of 1785, and it was probably built to the same gauge so it could utilise the existing track. Thus, the use of 4 feet 8 inches by George Stevenson at Killingworth was it because it was the existing gauge of the Killingworth Railway. When he laid out the neighbouring Hetton Railway in the 1820s, he used the same gauge. He didn't invent what became known as a standard gauge, because it already existed, and he built his locomotives to suit the existing gauge. When asked why the Canterbury and Whitstable Railway way down in Kent was laid to the Killingworth gauge, he replied that one day the two would be connected. In this he was proved right. Wherever George built a railway, be it the Stockton and Darlington, Liverpool and Manchester, or Leeds and Selby, it was to the same Killingworth gauge, and if any new railway wished to connect to it, then it too would have to adopt the same gauge. Thus the spread and adoption of the 4 feet 8 inches, later 4 feet 8 and a half inches gauge, as the standard gauge in mainline Britain in 1846, was not a deliberate policy, but rather because there was so much more of it than any other gauge. And we look at the 1846 Gauge Act, in another video. By far the biggest development in railway track was the use of iron. At first cast iron was used. In the 1790s bar rails came into use replacing timber. They were literally long rectangular bars of iron cast with integral feet which could be secured by bolts to heavy stone blocks. These rails were about three feet long and were very brittle meaning only light loads could be carried. These rails would have needed flanged wheels in order to run on them. But yet these bar iron rails were popular because they greatly reduced the friction between the wheel and the rail compared to the older wooden railways and were far more durable. The first public railway in Britain, the Lake Lock Railroad opened in 1798, used bar rails. The other development at about the same time was the flanged tram plate, which was popularised by Benjamin Outram, from whom it was once thought the term tramway derived, but this is another myth. They were made from cast iron and L-shaped in profile with a flange on the inside to guide the wheel. They were about three feet long and secure to heavy stone sleeper blocks. 
This meant that ordinary wagon wheels could be used, wooden or cast iron. Again, being cast iron they were quite brittle and unable to support heavy loads and were unsuitable for locomotives. Although popular, the tram plate was really a cul-de-sac in terms of rail development. Some areas, especially in the northeast of England, remained faithful to the use of edge rails and flanged wheels, however. In order to make the bar rail stronger, it had to be made thicker. But this meant that the rails were heavier, used more iron and were therefore more expensive to make. Josias Jessup therefore came up with the elliptical or fish belly rail. Working from basic beam theory, he reasoned that the cast iron rail could be made thinner towards the ends where it was supported in a chair and by a stone sleeper, and thicker in the middle, the furthest from its point of support. Given that the arch is the strongest form, the lower edge of rail therefore followed a graceful ellipse. They were cast in short three feet lengths and were stronger and more durable than the older bar rails. Whilst Trevithick's Penudaran locomotive had been built for a tramway and had smooth wheels, those of Blenkinsop, Stevenson and Chapman and Buddle were all built for edge rails and used flanged wheels. Puffing Billy, however, built by William Headley for the 5 foot gauge Wylam Wagonway, had smooth wheels which ran on L-shaped tram plates. The first engineer to see the fundamental link between the locomotive, the wheel and the track it ran on was George Stevenson. He took what would now be termed a systems-wide approach. He recognised that in order for the locomotive, and thus the railway, to be more effective, both the locomotive and the track had to be improved. The old Jessup fish belly rail had lots of joints which made for a very rough ride indeed. In his 1816 patent with William Losh, Stevenson introduced half lap joints rather than the old fashioned butt joints of the Jessup rail and this made for a far smoother ride. These half lap joints were secured by a bolt which also passed through the chair and this also meant that the rail would stay relatively level even if the stone block supporting it had slumped. Stevenson also recognised that railway wheels needed not just flanges, but that the wheel should be coned as well. The coning of the wheel helped it stay on the track, but more importantly helped it go around corners by allowing the inner and outer wheels to revolve at slightly different speeds. From cast iron rails, the next step was wrought iron, or as it was then termed, malleable iron, and wrought iron fish belly rail was rolled by John Birkinshaw at the Bedlington Iron Works, and he patented it in 1820. Wrought iron is far stronger than cast iron, and rails could be now produced in lengths of up to 15 or 18 feet. Birkinshaw also proposed the use of a rail with a T-shaped profile, although this development is sometimes ascribed in the United States to John Stevens around 1831. Another advantage of wrought iron rail over cast iron was that it could be bent, which made the setting out of curves far easier. With cast iron rails, curves were laid from individual straight sections of fixed length, whereas with wrought iron a proper curve could be laid. To his credit, despite his own personal financial gain from using his patent cast iron rails on the Stockton and Darlington Railway of 1825, George Stevenson recognised the superiority of the Birkenshaw wrought iron rail and adopted that, much to the chagrin of Loche, of course. With the opening, in particular, of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1830, track development evolved rapidly. No one had hitherto run trains at such high speeds, such a weight or frequency as the Liverpool and Manchester had done, and wrought iron fish belly rails were rapidly breaking, usually at their narrowest point, a few inches from the chair. Emergency provision of extra chairs and sleepers to support the rail in the middle of the fish belly was only a short term fix. A longer term fix was needed. That came with a change in rail profile and rail weight. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway in the early 1830s became a veritable track laboratory. Clearly, fish-bellied rail was not suitable for a high-speed railway. What was needed was parallel rail, 
a form of rail with a uniform profile for its entire length. By 1834, the Anglo-Irish engineer Charles Black of Vignoles had essayed a flat-bottomed form of rail with a broad foot, and this meant it spread the weight more evenly and could be fastened down to the sleepers without the need of a chair. About the same time, Joseph Locke came up with a form of double-headed rail. He had the intention that once one head had become worn, it could be turned over and the rail reused. It was a great idea, but it didn't necessarily work in practice. Henry Booth, the secretary, treasurer and general manager of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, was also involved in designing rails, and he essayed his own form of parallel rail with an asymmetrical profile. And that type of rail became incredibly popular, and was of course used on the Liverpool and Manchester. By the 1840s, there was a dizzying array of rail profiles and types of chair in use, but most were variations on the Vignoles flat bottom rail, the lock rail, or booth. The American engineer Robert Stevens had visited the Liverpool and Manchester in the early 1830s, and where he met both Vignoles and Henry Booth. Stevens designed his own rail, and this had an asymmetrical profile like that of Henry Booth, but it also had a flat bottom, like that of Vignoles. The design was further refined by John Guest of the Dowlace Ironworks in South Wales, and the first Stevens rails were rolled in South Wales at Dowlace. Towards the 1850s, the most popular form of rail in Britain was the Bullhead Rail, and this became the standard rail profile for the next century, being replaced by flat bottom Vignoles rail, which was far easier and cheaper to maintain, from the 1950s onwards. As rails changed in profile, so too did they become more durable by being heavier. The earliest Liverpool and Manchester rails had weighed only £35 to a yard, but by the middle of the 1830s were weighing more than twice that. Yet, despite all these developments with the rail, the sleepers continued to be large, heavy square stone blocks laid diagonally, their corners almost touching, into the late 1840s. These stone blocks were laid in a thick bed of ballast, which helped drain the railway and provide a certain amount of cushioning. Finer grades of ballast were then used to pack around the blocks to prevent them moving, and the ballast was laid and packed so that only the very tops of the rail could be seen, the stone blocks being completely buried. It had yet to be fully appreciated that the railway needed to be elastic, that the railway is dynamic, and it was then believed that the permanent way should be as solid as possible. It's no wonder wheels and rails kept breaking. Stone blocks came to replace by timber sleepers, which unlike stone blocks had a distressing tendency to rot or split, these wooden sleepers provided a degree of elasticity, and as a result made a much quieter and smoother ride. So that has been a quick look at the track, an often overlooked but fundamental part of the railway. After all, it's what makes a railway a railway. I hope you have enjoyed this whistle-stop tour of the permanent way, and if you have, please like, share and subscribe, and see you next time on Rail Story.